Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Nuclear Criticality Safety Lecture Series. Unlike in the early days of criticality safety, modern nuclear criticality safety analyses are driven by high-fidelity modeling and simulation tools. These tools are powerful, flexible, and they allow us to analyze almost any system we can imagine, but it's important to understand these codes' limitations, their pitfalls, and when they might be inaccurate. Code Verification and Validation, or V and V, is the process that allows us to confirm the accuracy of these modeling and simulation tools. So what's the difference between verification and validation? The ANSI ANS 824 standard defines verification as the process of confirming that the computer system correctly performs intended numerical calculations, while validation is the process of quantifying, or in other words, establishing the appropriate bias and bias uncertainty, the suitability of a computer code system for use in nuclear criticality safety analyses by comparison with benchmark results. In more simple terms, verification checks that our code got the answer that we think it should get, while validation checks that this result is actually accurate by comparing it against real-life, experimental benchmark results. Before we dive too far into the code verification and code validation process, what kinds of codes do we generally use for these criticality safety calculations? Radiation transport calculations can generally be performed with either deterministic codes or Monte Carlo codes. What's the difference between these two classes of codes? This may be a review for some people, but in summary, deterministic codes solve the Boltzmann transport equation by discretizing it in terms of space, energy, and angle, or direction, into a series of simultaneous equations, and then these codes use matrix solvers to solve these equations to get the system's eigenvalues and fluxes. Deterministic codes generally have rapid, high-order convergence, but because they are solving a simplified, inexact version of the true system, they will always possess some innate bias or inaccuracy. In contrast, Monte Carlo codes model the system's geometry and, through the use of continuous energy cross-sections, its physics using as close to an exact representation as possible. Rather than solving the Boltzmann transport equation directly, Monte Carlo codes simulate thousands, millions, or even billions of individual particles, known as histories, using random numbers to simulate how far these particles will travel before they undergo some interaction, what kind of interaction they'll have, if the particle will survive that interaction, and if it survives, what the particle will do next. Because the accuracy of Monte Carlo codes relies on the code's ability to simulate a sufficient number of particle histories, a Monte Carlo code's results will always possess some degree of stochastic, or random, uncertainty. This uncertainty actually decreases according to the square root of the number of particle histories simulated. In other words, if we want to reduce a Monte Carlo code's uncertainty by a factor of 10, then we'll need to run 100 times as many histories. So in contrast to deterministic methods, Monte Carlo methods give you an inexact, stochastically noisy solution to an exact representation of your problem. With enough histories and enough runtime, Monte Carlo codes will converge to the true behavior for whatever system they model, whereas deterministic codes will always converge to an approximation of the true system. Thus, the criticality safety community tends to prefer Monte Carlo codes because they contain no innate method bias. Some commonly used Monte Carlo codes include the MCMP code from Los Alamos National Laboratory, the Kino code within the Scale code package from the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, the Serpent code from VTT in Finland, the research-focused OpenMC code from MIT, the COG code from Lawrence Livermore National Lab, the MONK code from ANSWERS in the UK, the Moray code from the IRSN in France, and the Tripoli code from the CEA in France. So since Monte Carlo codes use a nearly exact representation of the problem's geometry and physics, that must mean that they're infallible, right? Wrong. Some common sources of error in Monte Carlo simulations include errors in, or simplifications to, the geometry of the system that we're modeling, errors in the system's material specifications or densities, and errors or uncertainty in the nuclear data. The impact of error from points 1 and 2 is documented and quantified in integral benchmark evaluations, 
so Monte Carlo comparisons with integral benchmark results will already have a good understanding of the impact of error from points 1 and 2. Thus, code validation studies will generally focus on quantifying the impact of errors or uncertainty in nuclear data. Other possible pitfalls for our Monte Carlo codes include 1. Failure to anticipate abnormal conditions which should not be a concern if we have a healthy safety culture and design our operations with adequate safety margin. Number two, having errors in our Monte Carlo code inputs, which in practice is usually not a concern since criticality safety integral benchmark models usually undergo a rigorous VNV process at each site. Number three, errors or bugs in the Monte Carlo code itself. While several codes have identified safety significant bugs, well-maintained and well vnv Monte Carlo codes tend not to have any significant method bias. Studies by Dr. Forrest Brown have confirmed this for the MCMP Monte Carlo code from Los Alamos. In these studies, Dr. Brown used MCMP to simulate systems with geometries and physics properties that allowed them to have exact analytical solutions. These systems used artificial cross-section data, which Brown then used to simulate these systems using MCMP. Since we know exactly what eigenvalue these systems should converge to, any difference between the MCMP solution and the analytic solution was a sign of code bias or bugs or errors in MCMP. Brown grinded down the statistics for these problems and found that they converged almost exactly to the analytical solutions. Any disagreement with the analytical solutions was well within the bounds of statistics. Fourth, we assume that the random number generator used by Monte Carlo codes is truly and completely random. This is certainly not true, since Monte Carlo codes all use pseudo-random number generating algorithms for generating their random numbers. However, these algorithms are designed so that they generate random numbers in a pattern that is statistically equivalent to a random distribution. So for all intents and purposes, we can assume that our random numbers are completely random. One consideration that could cause random number generators to cease to be random is if they start to repeat themselves. In that case, once a random number generator starts repeating itself, your Monte Carlo code could be simulating the same histories over and over again, resulting in an answer that seems converged, but that actually contains the same amount of uncertainty as one single repetition of the random number generator. However, Random number generators like the Mersenne twister algorithm are designed to have an enormously long period before they begin to repeat themselves. The Mersenne twister has a period of 2 to the power of 19,937 minus 1, which is about equal to 4.315 times 10 to the power of 6,001 random numbers, which is more than enough for any Monte Carlo simulation. Lastly, we must make sure that our Monte Carlo code is installed, compiled, and built correctly. Monte Carlo codes generally come with a suite of regression tests to help verify that the code is installed correctly, and any site that is using a Monte Carlo code for nuclear criticality safety must verify this and must verify that the code is producing the expected results. This is actually quite a rigorous process that requires a significant amount of staff time. This process is so onerous that many sites will often use versions of Monte Carlo codes that are several years old, perhaps even decades old, just because it is too expensive to redo the V and V for the newest release of the code. So assuming that we have avoided these other pitfalls, it seems that uncertainty in nuclear data is the most likely reason why a Monte Carlo code could produce incorrect results. The Fundamental Theorem of Tsunami, which is a sensitivity and uncertainty analysis code from Oak Ridge National Lab, asserts just this, that bias in high fidelity modeling and simulation codes is primarily driven by errors in the nuclear data. A consequence of this theorem is that any validation efforts, which aim to understand the computational bias in Monte Carlo simulations, should focus on understanding the impact of nuclear data uncertainty on the Monte Carlo simulation results. Understanding the computational bias in Monte Carlo codes is primarily a statistics-driven process, and it requires estimating the upper subcritical limit, the computational bias, and the bias uncertainty by comparing Monte Carlo simulation results with the results of integral benchmark experiments. The upper subcritical limit, or USL, 
is the maximum value for the calculated k effective that will ensure that the system we're modeling remains subcritical. To determine the USL, we must start with an eigenvalue of 1 and first subtract the desired margin of subcriticality, which is the margin by which we want the system to remain subcritical. We could perhaps ignore this margin, but designing for a system that is just barely subcritical is pretty risky, so having this margin is usually a good idea. DOE facilities will generally use a margin of subcriticality of 0.02, corresponding to a maximum K effective of 0.98, and NRC regulated facilities will generally use a margin of subcriticality of 0.05, corresponding to a maximum K effective of 0.95. To ensure that our system's eigenvalue remains below this limit and margin, our limit for a k-effective must then add in the code bias, subtract the bias uncertainty, and then subtract the area of application uncertainty. The computational bias for a code is defined as the difference between the code's estimate for a system's eigenvalue and that system's true eigenvalue as determined by experimentation. A bias that's greater than zero suggests that the code is being conservative and overestimating the eigenvalue of the system, while a bias that's less than zero suggests that the code is underestimating the eigenvalue. A positive bias is usually a good thing, since it suggests that we don't need to worry about computational bias from our code. Our code is inherently conservative, while a negative bias could potentially lead to a criticality concern. Thus, the bias that we usually use in our USL equation, beta tilde, is the minimum of zero and the actual computational bias. This means that bias can only cause our calculations to become more conservative. We neglect and do not take credit for any positive bias when our code overestimates a system's eigenvalue. One can perhaps argue to try and take credit for a positive bias, but generally we do not do this, just so we add more conservatism to criticality safety analyses. Designing a fissile material operation whose simulated K effective is actually super critical just doesn't really seem right. After we add the negative bias to the USL, we must also subtract the bias uncertainty, which is the amount of uncertainty present in our statistically estimated bias prediction. We must also subtract some additional margin in case the critical experiments used in the USL and the bias calculation do not completely match the same area of applicability of the target application for which we are validating our code. The NRC New Reg CR 6698 document is one of the golden standards for code validation and provides some excellent guidance for code validation analyses. 6698 states that critical experiments selected for inclusion in the validation must be representative of the types of materials, conditions, and operating parameters found in the actual operations using the calculation. In other words, even though we have a delta k AOA in our USL equation, our computational bias calculations must use benchmark experiments that are representative of our target application. Using experiments that are not similar to the target application violates the rules of statistics since it draws inference on data that is outside of the given set of experimental data. New Reg 6698 also states that a sufficient number of experiments with varying experimental parameters should be selected for inclusion in the validation to ensure as wide an AOA as feasible and statistically significant results. Let's break this statement into two parts. First, we must include enough benchmark experiments to produce statistically significant results. USL calculations are generally statistical analyses, and so it makes sense that we should include enough data points to produce statistically significant predictions. Second, including a variety of similar benchmark experiments helps to improve coverage of our target application, as it helps to ensure that any potential impact of uncertain nuclear data is accounted for in at least one of the benchmark experiments. Lastly, 6698 states that Use of experiments outside of the identified AOA should be justified. This statement makes sense too. It doesn't make sense to use HEU benchmarks to validate a pure plutonium-239 system, and we should have to justify why we include benchmarks that are statistically dissimilar compared to our target application. 
If these experiments are at best contributing noise and at worst biasing the results of our validation study, then we should not include them. And so to summarize the 6698 NUREG, when we perform validation studies, we will want to include benchmark experiments that are neutronically similar to our target application, and also to use enough experiments to provide statistically significant predictions. So how do we determine if a benchmark experiment is similar to a target application? Some qualitative similarity metrics include whether the benchmark uses the same fissile nuclides as the application, whether its fuel has a similar enrichment as the application, whether they share similar fuel and moderator compounds, and if these compounds have similar densities, and whether the systems share similar degrees of moderation, which is usually quantified by the H to X ratio or by the system's spectrum. The EALF is the energy corresponding to the average lethargy of fission, and it's a common metric for representing how fast or how thermal a system's spectrum is. Later on in this course, we'll discuss some other, more rigorous, quantitative metrics for similarity assessment that involve computing sensitivity coefficients for the benchmark cases and the target application. Until we dive into the sensitivity-based similarity metrics, it's worth noting that the DICE code, which is the database for the International Criticality Safety Benchmark Evaluation Project, can help us identify similar benchmark cases. DICE allows us to easily search and sort through the 4,000 plus ICS BEP cases and to filter cases for things such as fissile nuclides, their neutron spectra, their degree of moderation, and many other parameters. DICE can be a very helpful tool for identifying benchmark cases that share similar characteristics with a target application. Later on in this course, we'll discuss how many similar benchmark experiments we need to gather, but assuming that we do gather a sufficient number of sufficiently similar benchmark experiments, how can we use them to estimate the computational bias in our codes? Estimating computational biases generally involves estimating C over E ratios, which are the ratio of the code's calculated eigenvalue to its experimentally measured integral benchmark eigenvalue. If we know the C over E for a target application and the calculated K effective from our code, then we can use these two quantities to estimate the true experimental K effective for that system if it were to be built and to exist. Estimating C over E's for our target application is our goal in validation studies, since these C over E's allow us to estimate the code's computational bias for some application, and by extension allow us to estimate the application's true K effective. So how do we estimate these C over E's? We'll discuss several statistical methods for estimating these C over E's in the coming lectures, but in general, we estimate the C over E value for a target application using a statistical analysis of C over E's for similar benchmark experiments. If our target application and our benchmarks share the same sources of nuclear data-induced uncertainty, and this data uncertainty drives why the C over E's do not equal one, then our target application is likely to have a C over E that's similar to the C over E for similar benchmark experiments. Often we'll want to use statistical methods to estimate the 95-95 confidence interval for the C over E's, where the 95-95 interval is defined as the lower tolerance limit where we have a 95% confidence that 95% of the data lies above some tolerance limit. In other words, at the 95-95 limit, we have 95% confidence that 95% of the population does not exceed this limit. If our population is comprised of C over E values from known benchmark experiments, then we can use this distribution of C over E's to quantify the smallest credible C over E for our target application, which thus gives us the highest credible K effective for that application. This concludes our brief introduction into the world of criticality safety code validation. In the next lecture, we will begin discussing statistical methods to determine a code's computational bias.